Okay, that was a weird echo happening. Did anybody else hear that? Or is that just on my end? I'm good on the side. You are? Okay, I wonder if some, did something start playing on my computer? Hold on. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of Generally Irritable. Getting things all set up on this end so I can answer your questions. Oh, yeah. I bet you it was this thing was playing over the other thing. Oh, right. Here we go. Here we go. Everything is all set. I am super duper excited for this week's episode. I, I probably say that every episode, but I'm always really thrilled with the folks that we get to have come on Generally Irritable to talk about what's going on uh, in Vermont, what's going on in the Burlington area, and um, how we can support one another just generally. Um, many of you who have been watching me for a while have probably heard me share about my Christian faith. Uh, I don't always make a big deal out of it. I don't always mention it in every episode because um, because I don't want that to overshadow all the other things that we're talking about. Um, and the reason that we do that is because the reality is the Burlington area and Vermont are actually kind of prejudiced against Christians. Like there's a lot of prejudice against Christians. I'm not supposed to use that word because it's supposed to be reserved for other people who experience prejudice. But the reality is Vermont is the most unchurched state in the union and Chittenden County is the most unchurched county in the state. And that really means something for the folks who live and work in Vermont who consider themselves people of faith. And it's especially challenged a lot of people over this last year during the pandemic. And I couldn't think of a better person to have on to talk about it than Mr. Todd Callahan, Pastor Callahan from Ignite Church in South Burlington. Pastor Callahan, say hello to everyone. Hello, everybody. It is great to be with you tonight. Yes. Excited so to be here. I am so excited because you're like a misfit. You're a rebel misfit who just is like, screw you. And those, those are my words, not <laughs> Pastor Callahan's. But I just love, I've loved watching your church specifically through all of this. Just really be willing to stand in the gap um, with, you know, so much more mental illness uh, people suffering from and all of this pain. And then the confusion about the government trying to control things and everybody just kind of like, ah. yeah. and, and through it all, you stayed true to the gospel. You stayed true to your congregation and your people. You remained open and welcoming. You made sure people had a home and, uh, and even more so, you know, not only that people could come find a safe space, but that you were actively, I hate to use the word advertising, but you've been actively sharing that there is a safe space for people to come to, not just kind of like, like many churches in Vermont who just sort of like, we're just going to stay over here and hope nobody notices us. You are just out there. And they're like, no, come, we're here. Yeah, absolutely. I have I have so many questions for you and I have so much I want to talk about. But why don't you start by sharing for just a few minutes about um, what it was like? First of all, first of all, I want to know how you got roped into coming up to Vermont. Um, I want to <laughs> know how that prayer. happened. Lots of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> so share with our viewers um, you know, what you, how you got here. Uh, well, first of all, you know, how you came to faith. How about that? Why don't you start telling folks a little bit about how you came to your faith? Um, and, and then what brought you and your family up to Vermont? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I, I grew up here as a, as a, as a kid. Uh, my, my, my father and mother came to pastor um, here where we are. Uh, right now at Ignite Church. Back then it was Maranatha Christian Church. Oh. And um, uh, we moved up here. I was six years old. We moved from North Carolina. And um, I remained here until I graduated high school. As soon as I graduated high school, uh, like many high school seniors are, uh, like, see you to Vermont. We're out of here. Mm -hmm. uh, I did the same thing and went down south. And um, I ended up in Orlando, Florida for 21 years. And um, 
began to uh, really begin to to understand the calling and the mantle that God had for my life uh, individually. You know, sometimes growing up as a as a PK, you um, oftentimes can ride mom and dad's coattails through some experiences until God has an awakening in your own heart and life. And you know, there were there were times where I told God, "I'm never going into full time ministry. Don't call me into full time ministry." I've seen what that's. Uh, you know, <laughs> that life has been like through my parents. Don't do it. I'm not going. I want to answer. You call, I want to answer. And um, so I remember uh, I was wor- I worked at a bank in Orlando for just outside of Orlando for about seven and a half years. And I remember sitting at my desk and there was just this, an awa- this, this, this thing pounding, the Holy Spirit pounding on my heart and awakening my spirit that it was time to step into that mantle. So I began uh, full-time ministry uh, in 2004. I uh, come up to Vermont to lead uh, worship here at the church for a couple of years, and uh, the, the the season just wasn't right. It wasn't uh, it wasn't as it needed to be. So we went back down to Florida and um, um, spent another season in Florida, uh, actually another ten years in Florida before uh, receiving the mantle to come here and pastor uh, this this work here. So it went from uh, Maranatha Christian Church to Living Hope Christian Church, and we changed the name when we took that mantle as senior pastors to Ignite Church, and it has been a ride. So it has been a ride. okay, so I just so everybody knows, you said uh, PK. Pa- it means preacher's pastor's kid. kid. Yeah. yeah. Preacher's kid, pastor's yeah. kid, just in case anybody doesn't know what that word means. So how long have you been back in Vermont this time? We have been back for about four and a half years now. Four and a half years. So basically I'm realizing that you also are one of those people who tried to leave and then just got sucked back in. Like yeah. Vermont is sort of like this vortex that just sucks you in and keeps yeah. you there. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's That's exactly what happened. It was a lot of prayer. We we had pioneered a church in Orlando. Things were going really well. Um, And God just began knocking on the door of our heart to come to Vermont. And um, matter of fact, my wife had the bags uh, packed and the boxes packed and things were happening before I had even, you know, finished praying through it. She said, I hear it. I know it in my spirit. We're going. I'm like, baby, you got to let me finish praying. I mean, let's let's make sure this is what we're supposed to do. And um, uh, without a doubt, this is where God... uh, uh, is, has called us to be for the season. And we're so excited to be here. Oh my God. That is so amazing. I remember. So I first heard about you guys and, uh, case will probably get mad that I, that I am dogging him out for this, but when, uh, last summer or last fall, I guess it was when, um, you were inviting candidates for office to come speak at the church. Yeah. And I, I remember being like, wow, um, I'm not even really allowed to share that I'm running for office. Like, I mean, all my pe- all my friends at the church know that I'm running, but I can't like have a table or anything like that. They were not announcing it. And you're going to let me come s- sit on your stage for five minutes and talk. That's amazing. Sure. And I remember one of the other candidates was like, Oh my God, you should see this guy. Go look at the video from this Sunday and check out his jacket. And if you got to see his shoes, you just have to see his shoes. And I remember looking at the video and being like, wow, this guy is a flashier dresser than my husband. And I didn't think that that was possible. Oh goodness. Well, we've all got our little, uh, our little uh, niche things that we like. And shoes is just one of mine. The wilder and crazier the shoe, the, the better I like it. So how many pair of shoes do you have? Oh my goodness. More than my wife. If that's season. season. <laughs> yeah. I know this has nothing to do with like being a Christian or anything, but I just think it's great. I love it. Um, it's one of the things that I love about my husband. Um, he has a bunch of crazy shoes too, and jackets and he likes to have fun. Yeah. And, and that was one of the things I remember being really attracted to him was here was this man. This gets to a point about Christianity, just so everybody knows. Here's this man who is handsome and smart and capable and he has fun and he'll wear silly costumes and he wears these flashy clothes and he doesn't take himself too seriously and he can still have a good time. And I just remember being really attracted to that. And then finding out that he was a Christian and being like, Oh, I don't know about that. Cause at the time I, I wasn't a Christian. And um, as I tell everybody, uh, I grew up in a family of Christians that are the reason why people hate Christians. 
Mm. And so it was really interesting to be down in Texas and getting to meet this whole new breed of, of Christian, because in mm. my mind, all I could imagine what Christianity was, was being mean and mean spirited and you think everybody's going to hell and you want to beat people over the head with the bible and if you don't believe then you're a piece of crap and we're going to alienate you and and we saw i mean that was a real thing that happened in vermont and i'll share i'll say in the burlington area just because that's where my family was and i really feel like a lot of the the hostility towards Christians in Vermont and in the Burlington area stems from this, this time period where what people thought it meant to be Christian was to be super judgmental and tell everybody they were going to help. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if there's like, do you, can you share anything about that? Especially since you grew up in the church can you share like what you've seen kind of change and shift since maybe like the eighties, the seventies and eighties that, you know, where the, I, I swear to God, the Catholic church has turned more people atheist than they've sent to heaven. Yeah. But I'm, I, I'm going to probably get in trouble for saying that, but no, the, you know, I, I can vouch for that. There's a lot of folks that, that I'm recently connecting with that have come out of the Catholic church. And there's a lot of not, not only theological, um, teaching that has to be unlearned, but there's a lot of practice of Christianity that needs to be um, reconfigured. Um, I think when we get to the point of saying, well, God can't move because and I remember the first time I wore jeans on the platform to speak, somebody about had a heart attack that I was in. <laughs> and as, as I, you know, you think about about how superficial um, that is, um, and that 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 one example can exemplify um, a whole generation of people having grown mm -hmm. up in the church. You had to wear the suit, you had to have your hair parted, mm -hmm. you had to be shaved, you had to look pristine because you were giving your best to God. Mm -hmm. If someone didn't show up looking like you, it would be where did they come from? Why are they here? Uh, you know, kind of thing. Not understanding that. God doesn't always show up looking like God and that we've allowed a lot of um, fundamental um, belief systems that really have nothing to do with the kingdom of God make its way into the corporate worship setting. And when we begin to evaluate that, realize that maybe God hasn't moved because we've put up the wall, we've put up the barrier, and we're trying to classify people within the subculture of the church instead of letting God bring in who he's going to bring in, how he wants to bring them in, when he wants to bring them in. And, you know, I think we're doing a great job as a church when church starts to get real dirty. <laughs> This is literally, I, I would say, you know, I've been sober for 12 years now. And I remember, you know, being at meetings, 12 step meetings, and you see the guy or the girl walk in that, you know, they're wearing like a half shirt and, and the pants are dirty. They look like they haven't combed their hair for a week. Yeah. Their breath smells right. like that's the person I want to talk to. Yeah. yeah. That's the person who needs us. That's right. You know, I don't, God didn't come to save the perfect That's right. and, and the pristine. He came to save the suffering and the downtrodden. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. So I've heard a lot of old timers kind of complain about that same thing you just mentioned about like, oh my God, the pastor's wearing jeans, world's going to end. Right. right. And oh, well, that's you trying to fit into the world and, sure. you know, like. I mean, you have to be relatable to a certain extent, right? Absolutely. Like you have to be able to relate to people. They need to be able to. So why, like, where's the line do you think between, you know, changing the way a Sunday service looks to make it more welcoming for people and being of the world? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of like, <clears throat> um, why don't you wear a tie? Well, I don't like the way a tie feels. I don't like a tie. A tie is not going to help me preach any better or any worse. A tie Are you is sure? Yeah. Are you sure? I'm sorry. So, I'm yeah, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's preference. You you like something like that? Great, wear it. And I think that you know some 
some ministries kind of take on the personality um, of the pastor because the pastor doesn't lose his personality. He doesn't lose the the the, the fabric of who they are mm -hmm. um, as a person uh, just because they're a pastor. So you know um, um, there are pastors who you know are, are going to dress and look one way, and there's pastors depending on you know how they've grown up, where they're where they're serving. Um, um, you know, maybe it's a denominational setting, uh, you know, and there's specific rules and guidelines and things like that where uh, they're going to reflect something different. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that the message of the gospel is any less effective based on what the pastor is wearing or how the people in the congregation look. Um, and I think that is a very superficial aspect mm -hmm. of, of um, Christendom, if I can use that term, um, that has caused the unsaved and caused people outside the four walls of a church to look inside and say, it's nothing but a bunch of religion. Mm. Uh, it's nothing but a bunch of, it, it, it's a show. Um, you know, mm. I won't fit in there. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're not going to accept me, things like that. So I think that stigma over the last um, seven to 10 years maybe has really begun to be broken. And I think we're beginning to see an influx of, of uh, new believers because the church is that it's relatable. We're not so disconnected from what's happening in the culture that the church seems incapable of speaking into the culture. I think yeah. we can get that way, um, but I, but I think we got to be careful to make sure that we're not uh, we're not walking in those steps. Well, and that's I I, I totally just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you said um, it's oh man. Well, it was going to, oh man, it was going to save everyone. I was going to ask a question and you were going to answer and like everybody in the world was going to get saved all at one time. Oh goodness. No, seriously. Um, so it just makes it, like, I, I'm so glad to see, I think you're right. I think it is starting to, you know, some of, oh, I know what it was. One of the things that I, learned about myself and and it's one of the things i ask other people when i'm talking to them about you know why jesus basically yeah. and i say okay so you got church hurt that's that's another term that we use in the church church hurt right like somebody hurt right. you in church um somebody was a jerk uh maybe even worse like you were molested by a priest or something yeah. like that awful right yeah. and what i always ask people i say okay so somebody was a jerk to you. What's that got to do with Jesus? Right. Absolutely. Why are you going to let your a relationship with a God who loves you unconditionally and wants only what's best for you because some human was a jerk? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and it's like Church people don't. Of imperfect people. There's going and, to be church hurt. And so then you'll have people say, well, if God really loved me, why did he let something bad happen to me? How do you answer that? Yeah. Well, it goes back to the the, the depravity of the mind, as the Bible speaks mm. of. It goes back to the, the carnal nature of mankind. It goes back to the sinful nature. It goes back to iniquities and it goes back mm. to proclivities. The things that we have to... Uh, deal with um, and and begin to uh, root out of our life so that we can become um, a, as as God's called us to be and what He's called us to walk in and reflect. You know, when we talk about when someone mm -hmm. says to you, "I see the glory of God on you," they're saying, "I they're saying to you, mm -hmm. I see the reflection and the image of God in your life." And and we all need mm -hmm. to be that city that's set on a hill that can't be hidden. So that mm -hmm. within that, there's always going to be these elements of our of our personality, elements of our um, demeanor that that may not be um, acceptable to others, and they're going to get hurt. They're going to feel offended. Um, yeah. And sure, we want to make that right, but we can't live under the microscope of thinking that church is going to be perfect and everybody there, no one's going to hurt me. Yeah, we've got I'm, a church. You know, every church is imperfect because the body of Christ is made up of imperfect people. My favorite is people will be like, well, Christians are hypocrites. And I sure. go, yeah. Yeah. Right. And absolutely. <laughs> like, that's the whole point. Yeah. I need Jesus because I'm trash. Yeah. I, I, my husband and I keep saying, we got to stop saying that we have this, yeah. we have this saying that like, 
you know, the reason we don't trust the government is because people are trash and the government is people. Sure. And what that really means is like, even in our best moments, when we think that we're being kind or generous, we can often be actually creating confusion or harm mm -hmm. in ways that we don't realize. That's what we mean when we say people are trash because yeah. we are by nature selfish and self-centered. And mm -hmm. so I am not confused when people let me down. Yeah, absolutely. I sort I of expect it. In the right categories. If you have people mm -hmm. in the wrong category, then you're going to get hurt. You're going to be broken. You're going to, to, to feel as though uh, that relationship's compromised. And I think as we put people in the right category, we have the right expectations out of that relationship. When you say category, what does that mean? Like, what are some examples of categories? There's a, there's a saying that, that there are people that come into your life for a reason, for a season, and for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to make sure that we've got, um, you know, those who are friends, those who are confidants, those who are part of our inner circle, we've got to make sure that we, um, I don't want to use the term label, but we put those relationships in the right category. So we know what to expect out of them. If I, if I have got someone who I know is just going to be in my life for a, a, sh a short season, I don't go, you know, for a cup of coffee with them and spill my entire life, um, you know, sharing with them because I know that relationship is, is going to be sort of superficial. It's going to be short term. Mm -hmm. um, if I've got someone who has invested into my life and I know they're going to be around for an extended period of time, that's where those deeper conversations uh, can be had. So I think sometimes in, in church circles, we think because everyone's Christian, that everyone is an open door because we're of like faith, we're of like mind, we're of like spirit. But you, you just cannot be an open door to everyone who's, who walks into your, you know, your, yeah. your sphere. Well, and I think that there, the, you know, in our culture now, everything is about, you know, at my truth and my happiness. And if you don't know how to act right and you hurt my feelings, well, I'm just going to buy, you know, right. whatever the, you know, the colloquialism is of the day. It, it's yeah. just every, everyone is disposable. Right. And, and then you wonder why you have people who are in, you're in relationship with, like, so everybody's disposable, right? But if you're in a relationship with anybody for any extended period of time, I mean, you know, you how long have you been married? Uh, we, actually, our anniversary is tomorrow. <gasps> Happy yes. anniversary. And it'll be 21 years. Oh my God, that's yeah. amazing. Happy Thank anniversary. You. Thank you. And Thank then, you. And then how old is your oldest kid? She is 20. 20, okay. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it'll be 22 years tomorrow and she's 20, yeah. Oh my God, okay. Yeah. So how many times in those 20 and 22 years, did you just want to like punch one of them in the face? Like oh, real sure. talk. Yeah, you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. I love my husband. I sure. adore him. We regularly bicker. Yeah. So where, where do you think this idea comes from that like, oh, well, every relationship is just supposed to be easy peasy. And if oh, anybody yeah. hurts my feelings, it's because they're a terrible person. It can't be yeah. like I'm responsible in any way or, you know, where does that come from? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I we, we, my, my wife and I, um, we dated um, for several years before we got married and uh, began to learn the idiosyncrasies of communication. Uh, we were, uh, when we met, she was um, uh, just turning 18. I was 19. And, um, you know, so we were still, she was living with her parents. I had just gotten my apartment in Orlando and I'm living on my own. And now I have to learn how to communicate outside of my own family with someone who doesn't know me and I don't know them. And now we have to get to know each other. And I tell you, when, you know, when we got married and began, it was the first time, obviously each, each of us have ever lived with one another. So now we're having to learn the idiosyncrasies of, of the toilet paper coming over the top of the toilet paper. Coming <laughs> or this is how I clean. And this is how you don't clean, you know, mainly me, uh, you know, and, and so learning to, to communicate um, that way, teaches us what battles need to be fought and what battles don't need to be fought. Mm. And I think as a, as, a, as, a, as a husband and wife, there are just some battles that you don't need to fight. Mm. They're not worth, it, it's not worth the stress. It's not worth the, um, the, the things that may be said in the heat of a moment. And I think as, 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 
uh, especially as Christians, we need to take a look at, at how our words are going to impact the mm. future of that relationship and make yep. sure that we're honoring one another, husband honoring wife, wife honoring husband, and together mutually that relationship can continue to to uh, uh, be in wholeness and, and, uh, and love and honor each other. And it doesn't mean you're not going to disagree, but it's how yeah. you get through those disagreements. Well, and that's one of the things that is so interesting to me in in these communal larger disagreements that we're having as as Vermonters. We'll, sure. we'll keep it local, right? We could say as a nation um, and as a world, but that would be a whole other thing. But it's, I wanna, I wanna bring two things that you've said together, right? So one is we, we're gonna have disagreement, right? But especially as Christians, we are called to see one another as fellow children of God. Right. Right. Even the unbeliever, yeah. we, it is our job. First of all, we're supposed to be much kinder right. to people who are not Christian because we don't, we're not on the same team necessarily. Yeah. Like we, you don't, we don't have the same expectations of you as a person because you don't believe the same stuff we do fine, but it's even more so we're supposed to be praying for their soul. We're supposed to see each other as uh, you know, children of God, unique and divine, and um, everyone is special and important and in the image of God and all this stuff. And yet even Christians through all of this pandemic stuff are just like yeah, at each other. Absolutely. There's and been it, a lot of political di divide even within our faith. Yes. Yes, exactly. And it's like, how do we have we lost sight of that divinity within each of us? Is it, I feel like this is what I've been telling everybody. This is sort of what I came up with last year. I said, it's like, it's like, you know, Democrats are the wife. Sure. Right. Have you read the, the book love and respect? I have um, not. Okay. There it's called love and respect. Are you listening, Benjamin? Who wrote that book? Who's the author? Eggerts or something. He's not even listening to me. Anyway, it's this really good book. And it's like, basically the, the woman, you know, the Democrats are the woman in the relationship and they want to be cared for and they want to be loved and they want to be cherished and taken care of. And then the, and the Republicans are the man, right? And the, they want to be respected. They want their autonomy. They want to, you know, be in charge and, and be respected for the things that they bring. And they're, and we're just like, n we're just like not talking to one another. Sure. And so that might be okay if you're, if you're non-believers, if you're not Christians, but for Christians to be doing that same thing, like how have we lost sight of what's most important? Well, we've, I believe we've allowed the cultural influences to plague the kingdom influence. You know, Jesus came to bring his kingdom. That's what we are, mm -hmm. we are sent here to do. And we've allowed, I believe, the, the, the kingdoms of this world to influence an impact of the kingdom of God in a way to where we will step back and say, well, God, I guess you're not going to do it. Or God, I guess you're mm. not going to, to move in this nation or move in this state. And I think as we begin to realize that each, each and every one of us have fallacies, each and every one of us are imperfect, each and every one of us, God is still doing a work in. Um, I think it's all too easy to use the political landscape as a vice and a wedge to be able to separate um, hearts mm -hmm. and lives and minds mm -hmm. and be able to come at each other, even though we're, we're, we're saved and we're, we're, we're Christians and, and we're going to church together. Um, you know, I, I've told our congregation multiple times, you know, I, I don't care if you're Democrat, I don't care if you're Republican, I don't care if you don't, you don't believe one way or the other. Uh, all I care about is that you model yourself after the kingdom of God. And that's what we are here to reflect and represent mm -hmm. in the earth. And if we do that well, if we do that appropriately, as, as Jesus commands us to do, then we can turn the landscape of this, of this nation around. If we will just begin to pray and intercede, mm -hmm. God will hear the cry of this nation and he'll begin to turn it around. If my people who are called by my name oh, will get on their knees, <laughs> I would, wait, is, that's not Isaiah. What is that? Yeah. I'm so bad at remembering the scripture name. <laughs> but but humility, humble themselves and pray. Humility is 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 a is a vague word in this mm. in this culture right now. We don't understand what humility is. And humility is just exactly what you were saying. We keep mm -hmm. coming at 
each other. And if we will humble ourselves and not engage, we don't have to show up to every fight we're invited to. Well, and here's my thing. This is maybe crazy, crazy talk. But for anybody who's like, well, God isn't working. Why isn't he doing anything yet? What better way to bring people into the kingdom than to give them an opportunity to show them that they need him? Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm not saying like God like made the pandemic or anything like right. that, but but it's normally oh my it's great. somebody sending me messages and it was making noise. Okay. <laughs> what better way? Because I know for me, as an example, just in my experience, I didn't get sober until I had a reason to get sober. Sure. Um, and even coming to Christ, so I got sober. And, you know, I was in a 12 step program, so I was willing to believe in God. And then I met Benjamin and it started opening up my eyes. And when I had that moment, I was going through kind of a second bottom. That's not the right way to say it. I tell people I was having a midlife crisis, right? Because I had a good job with an office with my name on it and, you know, whatever. But I wasn't happy and I wasn't satisfied and I didn't feel like I was living my purpose and, and that was when I got reintroduced to Jesus and to this idea of Christianity and what that looked like. And I don't, I, God, I pastor, I don't know anybody that moves without having some pain involved. Absolutely. Like, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's some people you probably could name a couple. <sighs> Maybe well, not. I tell you, that, you know, that, that's that's how that's how we know we're on the threshold and the brink of what I believe is going to be the greatest move of God that this generation and this this nation has ever seen. We've gone through so much pain. We're so disconnected from one another. Uh, you know, racial tension is at the highest level uh, in, in in modern day history. Um, political tension is is, is an incredible uh, heights. So when we get to a place of realizing that that as believers, as Christians, we have the ability to speak into that. You know, the fact that you were surprised that I was willing to to um, have you come and share um, that, that one Sunday. Um, why not? We need to have Christians in political spaces mm -hmm. and places locally um, um, uh, throughout each, each state and around the nation who are who are representing the kingdom of God um, in, 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 the in the political spectrum of, of this country. And if we don't do that, and if people think, well, because I'm Christian, I, I, I don't have the ability to speak politically um, into this nation, uh, we're going to be headed down down some difficult difficult roads. I, I literally wanted to punch people when they would say stuff like that to me. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh, so you're going to leave it to everyone else? Right. Uh, right. People who don't share the same values as you, you're going to just let them be in charge of everything? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't, I, I wouldn't want to live in a, what the heck is it called? when the church is like what leads the country, a theocracy. Right, I wouldn't sure. want to live in a theocracy by any means. Absolutely. But there is a reason. I mean, they it, the founding fathers did say that this republic and the way that it was built was for a moral and just people. That's right. And you, you don't have to be a Christian to be moral and just, but it helps. Absolutely. Absolutely it does love thy neighbor like the whole point is like you know the government isn't supposed to be providing welfare you're supposed to be providing welfare i'm supposed to be provide like if there's somebody if there is a widow and an orphan in my community it's my responsibility to take care of them and it's almost uh, call I me mean, correct me again i'm not a biblical scholar by any means uh, but i would almost say that that's a sin to sure. obfuscate our responsibility to the government to do it sure yeah, I think there's a lot of, you know, this is why God gives us gifts. This is why he gives us mm -hmm. purpose. This is why he gives us a vision. You know, Habakkuk talks about the vision very clearly. I believe that we could change that greatly if people would get a vision for their life. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, if, if people don't, you know, the Bible says without, without vision, people perish. Uh, with, with, without hope, um, with, without, without faith, uh, we're headed down a difficult road. But I believe that if people would get a vision for their life and begin to, to walk in the fullness of fulfilling that vision and seeing that vision come to pass, that we would see, uh, we, we would see a whole, uh, um, uh, widespread age, um, dem whole demographic of people come off of that because they've got something to live for. 
Yep. Uh, we don't live for for the purposes of fulfilling government uh, mandates and government, <laughs> you know, walk in government laws or what have you. We 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 have been created to make a difference in the earth mm. in this territory. We've been given this territory as the people of God to go after it and take it for the for God's kingdom. Not just sit back and leave it to a bunch of politicians to do, mm-hmm. but for the body of Christ to get involved in that political landscape, for the body of Christ to get outside the subculture of the church and begin to connect with people who have lost their vision, who mm-hmm. are stuck in those areas and in those ruts of life where they've lost their purpose. And it's our it is our responsibility to go and seek out the lost and bring them into a place like a local church where they can come in, find God, find find a relationship with Jesus get surrounded by a company of people so that we can help them mm. discover their purpose. Mm, preach. Yeah. Preach. Okay. So this is a great time for me to pitch Catalyst Collective. Speaking of purpose, being here for a purpose, uh, Benjamin and I work with this organization called the Catalyst Collective, and they have a program called the Purpose Project. And it is literally a program designed for you to, to Uh, I went through it again when I wasn't a Christian and when I was going through my midlife crisis and it was like, wow, these people care way too much about me for no reason. And that was one of the things that was like another step of attraction towards the church. But it's not churchy in any way. So you can do the purpose project, whether you're a Christian or not, it doesn't matter. You go and they help you discover like your, um, you know, your Myers-Briggs personality type. What are the things that you're passionate about? What are your gifts and talents? Um, what are your roadblocks? Like, what are the things that tend to get in your way that you don't like? And they basic, and it basically like helps you get a vision for what your unique God given purpose is. And it's because of them that I'm doing this podcast right now. It's awesome. I I mean, really, it was like, I really thought that I was too damaged and too stupid and had screwed up too much in my life to pursue politics, which was my greatest passion. And they helped me see that. It didn't matter what I had done and that actually the stupid stuff I've done is actually of benefit. And now I have a platform to share with people like you too can recover. You can't, you have not, you have not fallen so far down that you cannot be redeemed and saved. And yeah. I don't just mean by Jesus. I just mean just generally. Yeah. Um. So that's my pitch. Everybody go to purpose project. Is it purpose project.com? He's still not listening to me. He has said, I don't know why I keep talking to him, but purpose project or just go to catalyst collective. And if you have questions, message me. So um, we have, so everybody that's watching as a reminder, I have Mr. Pastor Todd Callahan here with me from Ignite church. We're talking about Christianity and what it's like to be in hostile territory. And uh, so if you have any questions for the pastor, just just, uh, put them in the chat and we'll read them and ask. And um, just so you know, Olga said uh, toilet paper is top over always. I would 100% agree with her. Okay. Good, good man. I actually don't care. That's one thing we've never argued about. Um, I remember my mom very specifically one time, I don't remember what the context of the conversation was, but she was like, arguing about that stuff doesn't matter. If one person wants to squeeze the the toothpaste from the bottom and you want to squeeze it from the middle, just get two tubes of toothpaste. (laughs) There you go. There you go. That's my mom is freaking awesome. She's so smart. Okay. Um, okay. So Ray says, I've heard Vermont is one of the least church church going States. Does pastor have any thoughts? And we did discuss that a little bit earlier. Um, do you, you don't have any like statistics on that or anything, do you? I don't. Yeah, I don't. Um, I just know there's, there's, there's a, there's a a harvest field that is ripe. Ooh, Ooh, I like it. I literally tell all my friends in Texas, I'm like, yo, you don't have to go to South America for a mission trip. That's right. You don't have to go to Africa. I mean, you can do that. We ha- we just met a pastor uh, and his family are leaving for Laos in a, in a couple months. That's cool, but you could just go to Vermont. Sure, absolutely. Great mission field territory up here. I told, I, I, I probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but I mean, that's really why I stayed um, sure. the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I moved back at the end of 2018 to buy my grandparents' house. And and that same year was when the abortion bill passed, allowing up until the point of birth. And, and then I found out that there's no personhood 
uh, status for the unborn. So I can assault a pregnant woman, cause her intentionally cause her to lose her unborn child. And I will only be charged with assault on the mother. And I just remember being like, what? Yeah. Like what? We dehumanized babies so much to the point where we will just allow wanted full grown babies to be killed with no recourse for the person who did it. Okay, whatever. And then gun laws and all this other stuff. And I told my husband, I was like, I don't know where I am right now, but this is not where I grew up. Yeah. And I'm not sure what's happening, but I feel responsible to do something about it. Yeah. Like there was, it's like you said, there was just this calling on my heart that said, I was like, I can't leave. I can't leave. I have to do something. And I don't know what that means, but I have to just do something. Absolutely. And it makes me wonder because this is the thing. So speaking of the unchurched, um, unchurched state, why do you think so many Christians in Vermont are such chickens? I'm going to get so much trouble for that. I'm going to get so much trouble for that. But no, seriously, like, I can't tell you how many people I talked to that, like, I was trying to get some, like, evangelism stuff going and, like, oh, what if we did, like, a graffiti cleanup? That was actually going to go, but then the riots started happening and then it wasn't safe anymore. But, like, it was so hard to get people willing to do any sort of outreach or evangelism, like, you know, just going and helping feed the poor or, like, whatever. Why do you think everybody's so afraid. I mean, you know, I, I, literally, I, it says if, if God is with me, nobody can be against me. Okay. I'm sorry. Go talk. Now. No, you're fine. I think there's been a lot of, a lot of loud voices mm. over the years that are in opposition of what we as believers model. Mm. Um, I believe there, I, I think there are a lot of Christians that because they've left a lot of their faith experiences up to the pastor to go week after week after week there they, they maybe have not grown to the point of vocalizing their faith because they can't talk about it at work mm. uh, they've got unsafe say family maybe that doesn't want to hear about it so they're they're in they're in constant territory of of not being able to share their faith on a regular basis so when you take someone who doesn't talk about their faith on a regular basis and now say, well, we're going to have an outreach. Uh, we're going to be <laughs> things like that. They haven't had any practice in that. They, wow. they, you know, they've, they've been locked up. They've, you know, they're, they're, um, they've been backed into the corner so many times. It's, it's really uncomfortable for them. We actually, uh, just hired, um, hired on full-time a worship, uh, I'm not a worship, um, uh, outreach and evangelism pastor, who's our worship leader's uh, wife. She's overseeing our outreach and evangelism full-time because we've got such a harvest field that we've got to go reach here. And I believe that we are, uh, we are going to see the least, most, the least church state uh, in, in this nation. We are going to see the greatest move of God come out of this state. Ooh, we're going to have it. a revival. I'm believe believing it. in a revival in in Amen. Vermont or in the Northeast. The last one came out of California, so we're yeah. due. That's right. That's all I'm saying. Amen. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things that I think Christians are really bad at, okay, like I'm. This is we're ha we're gonna have real talk time. Sure. Christians are absolutely trash at sharing their faith yeah. and and arguing for the Bible or for Jesus or whatever. Because I shouldn't say that most of the ones I argued with before my husband were just not good at it. Like, yeah. like you can't say to me, okay, so this was one, this is one of the arguments that I heard was somebody said, okay, well, if, if evolution isn't a thing, then how do you explain dinosaur bones? And this person said, lit, this was, I think my sister told me this story. Uh, and the person said, um, to test our faith. Okay. And I was like, really? That was the answer? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, well, first of all, uh, uh, the big bang could just as easily have also been let there be light. Right. And, um, seven days doesn't mean seven days necessary. So like, you know, seven days in earthly terms is doesn't necessarily that mean that that's what it was for God. And so one of those days could have been when dinosaurs were there. And then, hey, a little bit later, humans were there. 
Sure. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude evolution. It doesn't preclude any of the sciences. Like none of those, that's not even a good answer. Yeah. I think, you know, when, when you look at apologetics, people just, it's, it's one of those things of not understanding how to defend your faith. You believe in Jesus, you believe in the word of God. Um, but when you have to stand there and defend your faith, why you believe what you believe. I think that's yeah. where we lose a lot of a lot of Christians. And that's why the Bible talks about very specifically, we've got to have our mind renewed daily. We've got mm. to allow the washing and the watering of the word um, to, to take place uh, in our in our life so that we can explain why we are the way we are, why we believe what we believe. How do you go and compel people? As the Bible says in the highways and the byways, how do you compel people if you can't defend your faith? Mm. And I think a lot of people lean on their testimony mm. more than they lean on the word of God to defend their faith. Well, God mm. saved me from this and God, you know, saved me from that. And that that's awesome. But, but why Jesus, why is Jesus mm. the only way? Um, why, why, why is there absolute truth in the Bible? But yet I believe something else, but you say, I can't go to heaven because I don't believe in what you do. So how do you know you're right? And how do you know I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult for some for some people to defend that because yeah. they feel as though they're demeaning the person that's asking the question by saying, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to heaven mm. because the Bible clearly states there's only one way to the father and that's through the son. So I, I think Christians kind of back away from those conversations mm. out of not wanting to hurt the other person's feelings or not wanting to cause um, uh, any animosity from the one asking the question. So I, I think we've allowed the culture and difficult relationships to get in and plague our ability to to em emphatically say Jesus is the only way. Yeah, I think that's interesting that that whole I'm right and you're wrong thing. I, I hear that all of the time. Like, who are you to say that you're right. you know the answer? Yeah. And to that, I often say I don't. I could, I could die and get to the other side of heaven and have been a hundred percent wrong. Sure. Absolutely. And, and if that's true, then there are other things that are true with that too. Like yeah. Jesus deserved the death that he got then. Sure. Cause he was running around telling everybody that he was God and that he was the way, the, the truth and the light. And that that was the only way to get to heaven. And if he was doing that and it's not true, then he definitely deserved what he got. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Number one, number two, if I am dead wrong about my faith, which I don't believe that I am. And that is you, when you talk about testimony, right? Like there's just things that I cannot explain. And there is a peace that I have felt that cannot come from this earth. That, yeah. that is what I know. And so I would rather live my life like it's true, die and be wrong. Absolutely. But, but live my life believing and knowing I'm getting goosebumps, knowing I'm going to cry. I might cry while we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> I knowing that that there is someone out there that loves me so much, despite all of my flaws, that yeah. he would give his life for me. That's right. I remember the first time I really grasped that. And that that was that was the day I gave my life to Jesus. It was like, wait a second, you mean I am perfect and whole just as I am yeah. and I don't have to hate myself for the for the things that I can't fix about myself and I don't have to feel shame and I don't have to feel I mean, not that a little shame once in a while isn't a good thing, but you know what I mean? Like, I don't have to like Absolutely. live in that under the weight of that. Yeah. Like what? And then I was like, everybody needs Jesus. Now I'm like, everybody needs Jesus. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have to be bold enough to go out and share that faith, oh especially in the middle of the climate that we're in right now. Oh my God. Okay. So let's get into, Okay. I'm, I, I normally don't take this many notes, but I, I was so excited. I wrote down all these questions because there's Absolutely. so much I want to get to. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So we have to talk about the pandemic. Yes. And the lockdowns. Absolutely. Um, I, I, 
so I, I, I found some articles in some of the <laughs> local papers being like, they're not wearing masks and somebody yeah. touched my elbow. And I was right, like, right. I was like, you were horrified that somebody touched your elbow and guided you. But I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor, do people get COVID through their elbow? No, Not I'm just kidding. Don't that. don't answer that. We'll probably get banned from Facebook and YouTube for like all That's medical all right. information. That, that already happened to our church, so we're you know practically we can't we can't we can't promote any more posts on Facebook. Uh, uh, you know, we were promoting um, our our Freedom Summit uh, this coming weekend, uh, next weekend actually, and uh, Charlie Kirk coming in June uh, to speak and. Um, uh, found out that Facebook has now disabled our ability to sponsor any ads and um, uh, on Facebook and Instagram. So, hey, you know, it, it's all good. We I, I, we took the live stream off of Facebook. Um, mm. I'd say in maybe May, we started realizing that there was a lot of shadow banning happening on our, mm. on our Facebook page. So, you know, we're not going to give those guys the ability to control um you know, our reach and, and what we, what we're able to, what we want to um, put out there as content. So we just took our live streams off of Facebook anyway. Oh, that is so, that is, so, uh, oh my God, that makes me so irritated. Um, there are still people who don't think that uh, like shadow banning and stuff like that is a real thing. Sure. But so, okay. So, and sorry if you, if you mentioned this and I missed it. So you're off Facebook now and Instagram, right? They've banned you or whatever. Well, they've, they've, they've um, suspended uh, your account. Suspended our ability to promote any events or any posts okay. anything like that. Yeah. Okay. But they gave you no reason. And if you wanted to find out, you'd have to go through some in-depth investigation. Correct. They would, they, they have to, I have to request an internal review and they will look at everything and, and make a decision on why we were uh, uh, adjusted the way we were. Well, and I think it's interesting. I've even seen people like reading directly from the CDC website being yeah. banned and yep. cut off because they're like, oh, that's not what people want to hear. And it's like, but that's what you said, the science, this right. is the science. Right. Yeah. So. So I'm going to ask you a couple of really hard questions. I'm going to sure. make you really uncomfortable now. Oh, so, oh so you guys have had, uh, you know, you've kept, you've stayed open. Um, you've been meeting, you have worship, you know, you're not canceling worship. Um, and your folks aren't up there in masks doing worship, which is stupid, but whatever, like I'm like masks anyway. So have you had any major outbreaks? I, no, we have not. You know, we we at the beginning of this, we closed uh, as everybody did at the beginning, um, yeah. uh, with, with you know some um, exceptions. You know, not really knowing what was happening, what was going on. Um, so we did that for several weeks and um, got to the point to where President Trump had made a statement that churches needed to be open. As soon as he made that statement, um, that next weekend, um, I mm. decided. If, if he's making this declaration on a national platform, and I wholeheartedly 100% agree, we're going to go ahead and open. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. uh, we remained open through the rest of, of last year. Um, and uh, um, as I had told um, our local law enforcement, as I had told uh, the health department here in Vermont, the governor's office, we will, I will watch the numbers. Um, and if there's ever a time where I feel as though the numbers are high and we've got outbreaks, we will take some time away mm -hmm. to, to help that, uh, to help that situation. We did that in January when Vermont had an increase of, of COVID cases. And mm -hmm. I made that decision. I didn't need a governor to tell mm -hmm. me to do that. I didn't need a health department official to tell me to do that. Um, Dr. Oh, wait, Lee, you I mean, wait, you mean you can think for yourself? Right. Isn't that what a concept? Do you mean you have a. A, a church full of people who trust you to lead them? Well, you know, here's the thing. If, if you want to come, then you can come. If you don't want to be here because you, you, you've, you know, you've got some things that you're working through and, and, and you don't feel comfortable in that setting, that's fine. You can, you can make that. So I totally interrupted you. Please feel free. Oh, you're to, you were saying something about no, Dr. Levine. I was saying Dr. Levine and I, um, we, you know, we, we've had some in-depth conversations and, and we're on different, paradigms and different perspectives and that and that's okay we've taken the precautions in at the height of this thing mm -hmm. everything 
we needed to do. We were separating rows. We were, you know, we're, mm. we're, we're still having, uh, we're still treating this with a chlorine based um, mm. uh, solution, which is what hospitals use um, around the nation to treat their rooms and their spaces. Uh, we're using UV light technology. Um, uh, we've got hand sanitizing stations. We're doing everything that we can do. Uh, we've got air purifiers um, throughout the building in the sanctuary. Everything that mm -hmm. we can do uh, to help make that space clean and pristine when people arrive. Uh, it's cleaned multiple, multiple times throughout the week. And uh, we've done everything that we can do to give that, make that space presentable and acceptable when people uh, mm -hmm. come in. And I don't see that happening at the mall. I don't see that happening in the grocery mm -hmm. stores. I don't see that kind of treatment happening in public spaces. We've put all of the safety on a mask. You think that Home Depot is doing all that? Yeah. The one the one store you were still allowed to go to? Right. Walmart? Yeah. No. Right. No. So right. I, I was glad to see, I, I don't think you guys got any like shutdowns or notices or anything like that from the state. Is that right? That's correct. That's praise Jesus. That's correct. Praise Jesus for that. Because I went to do a little extra research in preparation for the show just to make sure. And I was like, why were they giving, I almost swore, why are they giving crap to like, I remember the Irisburg church got a lot of, um, play in the media as well mm -hmm. and i've actually been surprised to see that they you know while they bluster a lot about what they're going to do and how terrible everybody is they didn't actually take much in the way of enforcement against anybody knock on wood right right so that's yeah. really good well, you know, it, it helps to have um, brilliant legal counsel advising you as well. Um, and I think Chris Ann, when she comes uh, to the church uh, next weekend, will will speak into that. Um, but you know, when you look at these mandates and you see how they've circumvented Vermont's own constitution, uh, not just the, the constitution of this country, but our own state's constitution, they've circumvented that. Uh, they've made that essentially irrelevant based upon the mandates they put forward. Um, it's very difficult for them to sit here and say, well, we're going to shut you down if you don't do as we say. Mm -hmm. uh, just because it's a pandemic does not mean the constitutional rights mm -hmm. of, of Christians, of, of any American, any, any a resident of any state are, are now um, invalid. But, but you have so many other churches. See, yes, yes. Yeah. And... All of these churches, this was the excuse that I was told was, well, you know, it also says in the Bible, give unto Caesar what is due Caesar or whatever. And I was like, right. yeah, are you yeah. serious right now? I had, I had Romans 13 thrown at me um, multiple times, um, multiple times about that. So, you know, just because Caesar says it belongs to Caesar doesn't mean it's Caesar, Caesar's. If it belongs to God and it's of the kingdom, that's where it remains. Just because Caesar says you can't, you, you can't assemble and have worship. My Bible says not to forsake the assembling of the saints. Well, pastor, you have technology. You can just uh, uh, allow that technology to reach people in their home. And, and, and listen, you, you cannot tell me that being in the house of God together as an assembly, gathering together as the body of Christ is the same as watching it on a computer it, and iPad or cell phone. It is not. And we are like we are human beings are pack animals. We need to be with one another. And so you like so many people already before this started had this sense of loneliness and aloneness Absolutely. and a lack of belonging, lack of community. And somehow you want me to believe that watching somebody on television is the same as being held when I'm suffering right. or having somebody hold my hand. That's right. You know, I can tell you for sure that my husband, when uh, we were, you know, going back and forth to places for six weeks of him not holding my hand, seeing him on Zoom was not sufficient. Absolutely. And a marriage can't last that way. That's right. Relationships, while you may be able to have a superficial level, there is something about the the energy. Like, I just... I know for me personally, the closest that I have ever felt to God, you know, other than like prayer and some other, like, you know, really big spiritual experiences 
in my day-to-day -day life, the closest that I felt to God was when I was working knee to knee with another alcoholic, taking them through the steps, working with them, helping them get sober, watching the light bulbs go off as they realize that they're actually free uh, and that they'll be okay. Yeah. There's nothing that has ever come close to that in my regular life. We're built to be relational. We're not built to be separated the way we have been. And, 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 and you hit a, a very specific uh, point about mental health. And that's why the Bible talks about the mind so much. Um, you know, I've, I've received messages throughout this, this whole year, this past year of people saying, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much longer I can live like this um, because they've lost hope. Yep. And, and when, when mandates become the driving force, when political mandates become the driving force to the hope that we have as a people, then we have lost sight as a nation and we have put, we have created, we, we, we've created a space for ourselves that's going to cause great damage to our, our, our spiritual well-being and our mental well-being. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh. Government is the golden calf. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. I just like probably people have been saying that for a year, but that just, just hit me. Yeah. Dr. Fauci and Dr. Levine and the governor and everybody like we have made them our God. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. You know, it, it's, and it's not that we don't value the perspective and the insight of scientists and doctors and, and of course. we value that. But again, we, you know, the, we have the ability to make decisions about our health, about our, our activity, things that we, I mean, this is, this is a free nation, uh, you know, yeah. we, we have the ability to do that yep. and um, we have to protect that and not, yeah. not necessarily just with uh, refusing or accepting a vaccine, but with our religious liberty and our religious freedom that we have been granted and given in this nation. So to put that in the hands of a politician is a very dangerous thing to do. Yeah, I no, I don't want I don't I don't need you to I don't need you to take care of me. Right. I need you to let me take care of myself. Absolutely. Like, they're not coming around making speed limits five miles an hour so nobody dies of a car crash anymore. That's right. That's they're not right. banning fast food That's right. so that people don't die of heart attacks anymore. They're not banning candy bars so people don't have diabetes anymore. Like That's right you don't think that you have that much right in any other aspect of my life. Well, some, but you get my point. Yeah. Why this and why now? Absolutely. Where? Oh man. I don't even know. My brain is just like, I, I just don't understand how we got to a place where people are willing to trust the government yeah. to the extent that they do. Yeah. Well, we had have people, a terrible track record. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> we had people reaching out to us uh, because I had made a statement based on in that article that you were you were um, just referring to who had said, you know, what the pastor was saying um, uh, that that if Jesus was um, was in this in this time that we're living in in covid, that he would be laying hands on the sick and, mm. and healing the sick. I'm like, yes, that's <laughs> biblical. That's what we're called to do as well, to lay hands on the sick, yep. to pray over them. And that was an attempt um, to to say to make it seem as though we were being um, unsafe by laying hands on the sick. Again, just because Caesar says it belongs to Caesar mm -hmm. and we're they six feet apart doesn't mean that I can't lay hands on somebody and come into agreement with them for their healing. And I think that if we would have had uh, more churches who were willing to, to, and again, I understand that the heart of the heart of a pastor is to make sure everyone is healthy, to make sure everyone mm. is, is, is safe. And I understand that. And I appreciate that. And I value that. Um, and I believe that, that I modeled that and I, that I, mm. that I did that to the best of my ability during, during this time, but that does not mean that we forsake the gathering and, and yeah. allow, and allow people who are not spiritually minded to make decisions about those who are. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I, Actually, so I'm going to speak a little, I want you to speak a little more on that, but I have to read Olga's comment. She wrote, sure. the cult of COVIDians has its high priests. 
Mm, that's good. That's a good that's one. Like that is good. I'm gonna <laughs> use that later. That's that is really what it is. But when you're talking about, you know, we're called to put hands on people and to pray for them and for their healing and and you know, especially given we weren't even allowed to see our sick sure. and dying family, especially. Um, I being uh, you know, by coastal. You know, right. the hubby and I live in Vermont and in Texas. Yeah. And I saw a very, it's a very different world, right? Texas now, especially now, there's no mandates. Um, there's some places who are still requiring masks and doing whatever, but, you know, all the mandates have been lifted. Obviously, Vermont is still very much shut down, very much restricted. And, but even last year, like last fall, last summer, um, you know, if you went into Austin or maybe the big box stores or like HEB, which is the big grocery store here, you definitely had to wear a mask and somebody might give you crap if you weren't wearing one, but you could go pretty much anywhere and people were not wearing masks. Uh, you know, you, you just, okay, we'll, we'll, you know, do the, do the little show and put it on to walk into the restaurant, but I'm going to take it off as soon as I get to my table. So it doesn't really matter. Like we went out for Benjamin's birthday in April. I think we went out on May 1st um, when the restaurants reopened to full capacity. We went out and the just the way, but then like in Vermont, I had a gathering, a political gathering at my house. We were outside. People were actually pretty socially distanced. Uh, some people were wearing masks if they felt like they needed to. Like one of our guests um, has health issues. So he and his wife were both wearing masks. Sure. And they were socially distancing. And I got screamed at by a lady. She's she it was so funny. She rode her bike by and it came and took her mask off to scream at us. Oh, um, goodness. you know, so you have these, you know, and they're they're you know calling the snitch line on their neighbors and all this stuff. <laughs> and people would ask me, why do you think Texas is dealing with it so much differently? And this is also keeping in mind driving back and forth twice. So we've, I've been on a plane. We've been at least a dozens of planes over the, over the year, both of us, and then drove, uh, drove to Vermont once and then back to Texas once during that time. And you just see how different people in the South are. Sure. That, and then you see how it changes as you head up North. And I told people, I really think the difference is Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. I think people in the South are uh, more comfortable with death. Sure. And, I, you know, I, this is totally anecdotal. I have no research to back this up or anything like that. But I really do think there's something about being a Christian where, okay, I'm good with Jesus. I have a purpose for my life. I know that there is more when I die. I'm not just going to be worm food. I've got eternity to go to. And so we're okay. If I die, like I'm going to die whenever yeah. God wants me, I'm going to die. And if it's of COVID, that's what it is. And if it's by a bus tomorrow or falling down the stairs. Yeah. Do you, can you speak to that at all? Do you think that's an accurate sort of hypothesis or am I like way off? Yeah, you know, it's definitely not the Southern tea that makes everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, though I do like my Southern tea. Um, you know, I, I think you, you know, you've hit something. I think, you know, when you, you, you relate to the South, you look at the Bible Belt, um, you know, uh, having lived 21 years in, in metropolitan Orlando, mm -hmm. it's such a melting pot and a meshing pot. They've got over 2,000 churches right there in metropolitan Orlando. And, wow. and um, you begin to see. Um, all kinds of different walks of life, demographics, but yet people mm. are still kind and loving and warm to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in different parts of the of the country, um, you know, I, I've spent some time in, in in many different states around the nation, and I kind of agree, you know, with, with what you said. And there seems to be a, a heavier, um, um, I don't want to say darkness, but a spirit up mm. here. England that just kind of permeates mm. uh, people's personalities and, and conversations. And, and it's oftentimes difficult to relate to somebody um, who hasn't been through an experience, what you have in another part of the mm. country. Um, but with that said, what a great opportunity to be able to come and, 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 and meet yep. people of, of um, different backgrounds, different heritages, um, yep. you know, brought up and raised differently and be able to reflect something opposite 
You know, there's a, there's yeah. a, a certain grocery store I love to go to um, um, around the area here. And, and uh, um, that's just one of my mission fields. I go in there and oftentimes they're grumpy and you don't want to have a conversation. And, you know, I just kind of get, you know, eye level and be kind of like, how are you? How's your day going? You know, and whether they don't want to talk or, or whether they mm-hmm. do want to talk, I'm going to engage them in conversation. Yep. Um, but, but I think there are barriers that we have to break, break through yeah. uh, in certain in certain areas of the country. And I, it is definitely more difficult in the New England area yeah. uh, versus the South. And, and I think when you get through the religion, you know, New England has its religious tendencies, mm-hmm. uh, religious um you know, based on Catholicism being very dominant and predominant here in New England. Mm-hmm. And religion is nothing more than conforming to an outer code of conduct. Oh. And, and, I, and I think that when, when you look at religion and use that term religion, it's where we try to conform outwardly and allow our, our um, transformation outwardly to affect our internal. A relationship mm-hmm. with Jesus, a relationship with Jesus changing us from the inside out. So we don't live outwardly, inwardly. We live, we live inwardly, outwardly. Oh and my God, that, that just blew my mind. That, yeah, I think as we begin to do that, it changes that whole perspective of, you know, well, the, 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 the South is, is, you know, more kind and more gentle. And, and well, you know, the, that's the whole Bible Belt era. You got grandma and grandpa still down there. Yep. And they've grown up in the church. You've got, you know, um, people from all walks of life. And though they may not be living out their faith every single day, they still have the reverence of, of what it means to go to church, what it means to be a believer in this nation, what it means to model the morality as a Christian um, and, 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 and in an opposing world. So I think when you get up in New England and you get into the intellectual part of the nation, yeah. um, that, that faith is one of those things where because it's faith and it's not A to Z and you can pinpoint A and B and B and C and C and D and, and unite everything together, we're walking out faith that does not necessarily answer everybody's intellectual question. It's very difficult for some to operate in that space of understanding what it means to be a Christian and live out our faith. Therefore, when you are evangelizing and you're trying to have outreach, people can seem very closed off. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it would be like if all of us in our daily interactions, uh, my husband and I went through this program called Landmark, and there's this one exercise that we have to do um, where you have to stand in front of another person, like really close, and just stare into each other's eyes for like five minutes. It's very wow. awkward at first. Yeah. yeah. But ever since then, I really go out of my way when I'm talking to people. Like you mentioned at the grocery store, Absolutely. I'm very intentionally looking at them in their eyes. How are you? And I really am genuinely asking, how's your day? What? How, oh my God, that's such a pretty blouse. Wow, look at that. Oh, those earrings are so cool. You know, yeah. fill in the blank. Absolutely. And, and the exercise is, is called be with Wow! because you're meant to be with the person. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to be doing anything. Just be with them. Yeah. And what that, just that presence, how much more you can see in people, how much more you can read, um, hear, I, I know not really hearing cause we weren't talking, but like, like you can, I, you can hear so much. That's not the right word, but you're just like experiencing them as a human being. Yeah, absolutely. And what if all of us could just be with the people that we interact on a daily basis? That's right. I'm going to challenge everybody to do that. Look people in the eyes. Um, Okay. So we are, we are coming close to a good place to close. So anybody that's watching, if you have a question for Pastor Callahan, you need to ask it now. Um, I see there's some comments. Let's see. I love Olga said, I'm not religious, but I truly appreciate this conversation. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like getting yeah. to know each other, understanding yeah. one another. Absolutely. Oh my God. This is the, I've, I've said to my husband, cause he grew up here. And he grew up in Colleen, a uh, military town. So very multicultural, right? When I, I remember the first time I went to a party with my husband, 
where he invited me to like go meet his friends. And it was every nationality basically was represented at that table. And it was like, I was one of two white people at a table of like 15. And it was like yeah. Mexican, Puerto Rican, Japanese, Korean, you know, everything. And, you know, so he's grown up in a place that's really multicultural. And as a result, they got to know and understand one another. Sure. They got to understand each other's cultures. They got to see what it was like to have a Puerto Rican mom throw her shoe at you. Like that's oh, a yeah. real thing. <laughs> uh, you know, Puerto Rican, so she can attest to that. Does, okay. Yes. Does she throw, does she throw shoes at your children? She does not. No. <laughs> okay. All right. I just curious. Cause I was going to have to give her crap about it, right. uh, but it's, but like some of these stereotypes are real and it's, yeah, absolutely. and it's not meant to be a cut and it's not meant to be hurtful. It's cute. Yeah. Like we're supposed to want to learn about one another. Absolutely. We're supposed Everybody to value so our differences. We're so scared of offending each other. I said, I said, if we went now that if you wear a shirt or you say something, it's now cultural appropriation. If you ask where somebody's from, it's racist. It's like, well, wait, hold on a second. Yeah. You're now making it so that I'm afraid of you. That's right. Because That's right. if if you're not a white person, now any I risk offending you no matter what I say. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so why would I then go out of my way to learn about your culture and learn about you and what, what makes you unique and special if I'm going to be punished for it? That's right. Well, you know, I've grown up saying, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. So now we're at the place in our culture where is that going to be acceptable? <laughs> because, I, you know, I'm insinuating something saying that when I'm trying yeah, to of course. give honor and respect to the person I'm talking to. And and that's not allowed. Yeah. Not allowed. Ooh. I still do it anyway. I do too. I do too. I'm just, I'm not going to, you're not going to keep me from talking. Right. It's like, are you trying to prevent us from being able to communicate with one another? It almost feels like that's what's happening. Absolutely. Like, no, you need to be as divided as possible. So be as afraid of each other as possible yep. and then just stay in your own little bubble apart from. That's right. That's right. You know, that, that, that's, that's, you know, that <laughs> that's so true. It's so true. You know, I, I, we could have been afraid of, of what the political kickbacks were going to be um, by, by uh, remaining open during this pandemic and, and uh, standing the way that we did. Um, but we, we, we've reached, we, we've received messages from different parts of the country, people who've um, heard the story or read, mm -hmm. read an article or, or saw on Facebook or what, what have you, or Instagram, uh, the, you know, there were things still happening. And, and uh, are you open? Yeah, we're open because we believe that we've got absolute truth in the word of God that we have to model for this culture. Um, if, if when we were determining um, how we were going to handle some specific things with, with, um, uh, with this whole COVID situation, we got to a point to where it was, if we step over this threshold, we're going mm -hmm. to deal possibly mm -hmm. with political kickback and re repercussions and things like that. But if, if we didn't and allow the government to um, uh, treat us as a doormat and we became mm -hmm. a doormat and we crack that door, it's very difficult to close that door once that mm -hmm. door has been opened. Yep. And so uh, no matter what was said, no matter what um, um, type of, of, um, uh, kickbacks were going to happen. We had to stand yep. firm on our belief and our, our, the values that we hold dear. If someone else doesn't hold those same values, that does not make them a bad person that I, yep. you know, if someone doesn't hold the same values that I do, I don't look at them differently. I'm not going to treat them differently. There may be some experiences in life. We're probably not going to share together, but I'm not going to look down on them. I'm not going to yep. speak to them differently. I'm not going to, you know, to say that they're this, they're that and label them. And I think that we've got to be careful as a culture to make sure that we honor the gift that each and every person is, whether they're saved, mm -hmm. unsaved, whether they yep. believe, you know, the same you, as you do politically. Every single one of us were created by God. Every single one of us have a gift. Every single mm -hmm. one of us have a calling. And if God gets a hold of their life, that's going to mm -hmm. accelerate that gift and accelerate that yep. calling. But we need people to begin to speak into this culture in a way that brings healing, in a way that brings uh, unity, yep. in a way that that this political divisiveness that we see in this culture begins to um, um, 
be eradicated and eliminated. And we understand that, that we are human beings. We are men and women in the same territory, in the same space. And we've mm-hmm. got to learn to love one another. That's why the Bible yeah. says, pray for your enemies, love your enemies. Yeah. And we've got to begin to learn to model and reflect God's kingdom, even in the midst of such a crazy political climate where people are at each other's throats. We've got to learn to love one another in yep. spite and, of all. Well, and that it's, it says, uh, love each other and love your neighbor as yourself. Absolutely. That's right. You know, I, we, uh, pe- uh, shoot, how does it go? Um, they will know who you are by the fruits of what is that? Like, God, like people should be, people should be able to differentiate us from everybody else. Absolutely. Absolutely. We should be able to, and I say this as a person who's in politics and I want to punch everyone in the face all of the time. So I'm like preaching to myself right now, but like, that is like, can you imagine if with all of the ugliness and divisiveness, all of us were just like, I love you anyway. Yeah. I love you. That's I right. love you while you spit in my face. Yep. Oh, That's okay. Right. Okay. So I want to end on some hope, but first, yes. first, I want to share a little bit about today's sponsor. This is me being really awkward because I haven't figured out yet how I want to do sponsorships, but we have our sh- first uh, sponsor. So I am wearing a necklace by Shannon Bundy. Her company, her website is called Parahelium. That is really hard to spell. So I'm going to show you guys the website here. One second. Let's see. Okay. Parahelium. P-E-R-I-H-E-L-I-O-N. Parahelionvt.com. If you can see that website up there. She makes really beautiful necklaces. You can see I've got this one on here. And she makes custom stuff. And I actually, okay. So just, so look at this. First of all, oops. That's another necklace she has on her website. I think it's super dope. I'm totally buying these earrings. They're amazing. She can make custom stuff. So sometimes she can make custom stuff and sometimes she can't. So if you were like, oh, I love these earrings, but I want them to have green stones instead. She can make it that way. But also sometimes she can't because one of the really cool things is many of her items are actually made from jewelry that she's gotten at yard sales or estate sales or things like that. So many of her pieces are actually one of a kind because she only got one of those stones or one of those pendants or whatever it is. And she made it from that or, you know, limited edition pearls or something. So you can actually get a one of a kind piece for like 60 bucks which I keep telling her she needs to raise her prices. Like, look at this. I'm totally buying this. It's $60. That's all pearls. Those are all freshwater pearls. And it's only a $60 necklace. Shannon, you need to charge more. So go to perihelionvt.com. Check out her jewelry. It's beautiful. It's amazing. I get compliments on my stuff all the time. It's why I decided to... uh, you know, have her be a sponsor. I, I wear her, I have so many of her pieces and I get so many compliments on all of them all of the time. Go to per- perihelionvt.com and check it out. Shanna Bundy, she's awesome. She makes really pretty stuff. Okay, so back to our, back to our programming. Now, before we went uh, live, Pastor Callahan, um, I asked you a question. I said, have you been seeing more people. I'm just curious, like have more people been coming into the church with all of this stuff going on, you know? Absolutely. And, and so I wanted you to share a little bit, um, of hope with yeah. our audience, um, with the, what you've seen, the move of God that you've seen in our community and, um, the, 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 um, baptizing and stuff. I just was like, that is so awesome. So I just yeah, love just, it if you'd share it with the audience. We had four people get saved Sunday at the same time. We had 27 people get baptized. I mean, that wow. was incredible, incredible people giving their heart and life to Christ. People who have uh, never been baptized the age ranges were unbelievable. And um, the background stories were incredible. Mm. And there is a move of God that's happening. And I think as we remain true and steadfast to that word, 
remains remain true and steadfast to what it is that God is asking each and every one of us to do as believers. There will be a move of God that transcends mm -hmm. anything we've ever seen before. But we cannot be afraid to use our voice. We cannot be afraid to allow our life to model what it is that, that we believe in, who we are as a Christian, who we are as believers. We cannot allow the political spectrum of this nation to be louder than the kingdom of God. Mm. We have to position ourselves. God has given us this territory. The church has for far too long not leveraged the authority. Jesus said, I've given you all authority. I've given you the keys to the kingdom. And we have not even in 2021, we have not learned how to leverage that authority, mm. that kingdom authority in the earth. And I think we're coming to a point in time, we're coming to a to a to a, an awakening in this nation where we are understanding what it means to leverage that authority in the earth. We've got to stand strong. And as we do, we will see the body of Christ grow. People who've gone through that church hurt that we were talking about, coming back to church. People who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, coming and being saved and growing in the knowledge of, of, of the Word of God. And I think we will see signs and wonders and, and miracles and healings begin to take place if we will begin to model the kingdom of God and represent that in the earth today. There's a mighty move of the Spirit of God that's coming, and there's no political divide that can stop it. There is no uh, there is no mountain that's big enough that will, will, will hinder what God's about to do. So I believe we're about to have an awakening. We're seeing it in this church. Um, we're seeing it across the nation. I just received a phone call the other day from a, from a gentleman who's out with Sean Foyt, and and they're having uh, incredible meetings out in, in, in um, on the West Coast, uh, believe it or not. And God is ha there's a major awakening that's beginning to happen. So mm -hmm. anytime you begin to suppress the body of Christ and you begin mm -hmm. to suppress the move of God, get ready because when those doors swing wide open, there is going to be a tsunami, uh, an incredible wave that's going to hit this culture and this generation. And I believe we're standing at the door. We're on the threshold of what's going to be the greatest move of God that our generation, our modern day generation has ever seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I just got goosebumps. Oh, yeah. A hallelujah. Amen. Praise Jesus. Yeah. yeah. All of it. Everybody out there should be screaming hallelujah right now. Um, I normally will say something to close, but that was perfect. So I'm not going to say anything else except see you guys all next week. <laughs> um, okay. So tell everybody before we go. Um, so I did, I put the church uh, address because people were like, where's this church? So I put the address and everything in there. Um, why don't you share just, um, like, when do you have services? Uh, let's see, share when you have services and then share, um, maybe how people can get in touch with you if they have, if they have questions and then a little more about those events you have going on coming up that, and how we can help you advertise since the socials are not letting you do it. Absolutely. You can go to the website, ignitechurchvt.com. We're on social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. You can download our church app on the Google Play Store and the, uh, the App Store under Ignite Church VT. And you can download that and you're, you're connected to everything that's taking place um, in the church. Uh, next weekend, we've got uh, attorney Chris Ann Hall with her husband. Uh, JD will be with us uh, Friday night at 7 p.m. And they will be with us all day Saturday up till 4 mm -hmm. p.m. We have an hour um, break in there. Um, uh, so that, that's a special time. Our normal services are at 10 a.m. on Sundays and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. This is outside of that. This will be a Friday night and a Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon. Uh, you can register for that through our website, um, ignitechurchvt.com. We've got a link for that that will connect you to iTickets. It's free registration. The only reason we ask for people to register is so we know uh, how much uh, lunch to order. Mm. Um, other than that, it, it is it, it is an informative time to empower you, to equip you, to strengthen um, every person uh, who is in this state, in this in this region, uh, uh, to understand what it means to uh, live in such a culture as this and make sure that you do not have your freedoms taken from you. So that's happening uh, next weekend. Uh, then coming up in June, uh, Charlie Kirk and Erica Franzve, his fiance, will be with us. That's going to be powerful. It's going to be an incredible time. He'll be speaking uh, June, I believe it's June 27th, which is a Sunday morning. He'll be with us mm -hmm. in service at 10 a.m. Uh, that is open. Um, there's no registration necessary for that. You don't want to miss that. That's going to be incredible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we've just we just partnered with Turning Point USA, so we're excited to begin that partnership and uh, are working uh, and looking into a, 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 a conference this coming fall uh, with some incredible speakers. So that's going to be incredible. You don't want to miss that either. So all of that will be on our social media. That'll be on our website. And um, God's doing great things. Amen. Yeah. Okay, everybody go to the go to their Facebook page, share those events with your people so we can get folks to know that it's happening. Uh, this is super exciting. And I personally cannot wait to be home next week and get to come to church and uh, be in there with you guys celebrating awesome. and uh, feel this energy because, oh, my God, I'm so excited. Yes. Okay. All right, cool. And oh, by the way, this was your inaugural podcast. It is. We just got a brand new podcast studio. So this is the first time we've uh, we've used it. So yeah, you helped break it in for us. <laughs> I'm, it's awesome. I'm going to have to ask you what that microphone is because you sound amazing. This is a um, have to look at this one. This is an electro voice. Ooh. It's actually the one that Rush Limbaugh would use on his program. Oh. But mine's not gold. I don't have the gold EID. Oh, mic. that's okay. You're not cool enough yet, you, but you'll <laughs> right, get there. Exactly. Right. You'll get there. All right. Okay. Yeah. Pastor Callahan, hold on with me one second while I end the live stream. Oh, thank you, Mary. Mary Sheldon says, thank you, Erica and Todd. And everybody's been awesome. Oh, this is so great. Okay. All right. Okay. Hold on while I end the broadcast. Let's see here.